Welcome to My Savior Lives Northland. This program offers you the opportunity to participate in a service of worship led by local pastors and members of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. MSL Northland is locally produced with a message for the world. Welcome to My Savior Lives Northland. My name is Pastor Kirk Shield and I am pastor at Christ Lutheran Church in Superior, Wisconsin. Today's service is being recorded at Gloria Day Lutheran Church outside of Virginia, Minnesota. You can also watch this service at MSL Northland on Vimeo, YouTube, Facebook, or on our website, mslnorthland.com. We'll be right back after this music. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved our neighbor as our, with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as, as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And here is God's great good news. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost is from Job chapter 38 verses 4 through 18. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescri prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall, shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 17. Here Paul writes, 
For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven, that it is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The intro for today is this. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately he, Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, this is the Son of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostle Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song must end Yeah.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for today's sermon is from the Old Testament lesson, Job chapter 38. Dear Christian friends, the passage from Job, which is our text, is in that portion of the book in which God is speaking to Job. Job, as you may recall, has been struck with horrendous calamity and had been experiencing terrible suffering. As a result, Job has done some complaining and has questioned whether God is always just. In response, God emphasizes his role as creator and sustainer of the world and that his ways are far above man's ways and that his power far surpasses man's power. Our text then makes us think of how God rules over the world and specifically over the human race. We are led to consider that God's rule in this world is total and good and affects both unbelievers and believers. So let's start with the truth that God's rule is total and good. God has total rule and control over all aspects of his creation. He reminds Job of this reality. This means that what God plans does indeed take place. Nothing can stop his will from being accomplished. This is because God is almighty. His power exceeds any other power. Our text emphasizes God's omnipotence, that is, that he alone is all-powerful. God's rule is good because he has infinite, perfect wisdom. God's wisdom is far above our wisdom and understanding, that is, a truth which God highlights for Job. This means that God does not make mistakes. He rules in a holy, just righteous manner. This also means that God does not reign in a capricious manner. Capricious is a big word that means someone is given to sudden and unaccountable changes in mood or behavior is, other, is unpredictable. It's unfortunate when one has an unpredictable or impulsive spouse or boss. But God is not like that. He is not moody or unpredictable, changing his mind all of the time, so that we have to walk as if we're on eggshells. God has a wonderful master plan. God is ruling everything for the welfare of his church, as scripture reveals. So, how does the total and good rule of God affect the unbeliever? First and foremost, God wants unbelievers, the wicked, in our text from Job, to repent and be saved. Since God is merciful and patient at times, a wicked man continues in his sinful living and could even prosper. We get angry or jealous about that sort of thing because we see it all the time. But the wicked will not get away with anything before the holy, all-seeing, all-knowing God. According to his timetable, God will send his righteous judgments against the unbeliever who persists in his rebellion against God the Almighty. Yet even in these judgments, there is a distinction which highlights the mercy of God. With some, un some unbelievers, God's judgments will affect them negatively in this life and re will result in their destruction in the life to come. With others, however, judgments will work to shatter their stubbornness and self-righteousness and make them ready to hear the gospel. And by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, they will be brought to faith and salvation. In all of his dealing with unbelievers, God is actually ultimately, it is ultimately actually for the good of his church. And how does the total and good rule of God affect the believer? The answer is that God blesses his people richly with both physical and spiritual blessings. And God also allows trials, calamities, and sadnesses to come into the lives of believers. These afflictions are actually disguised blessings. Why do we know that? If in all things God is working for the good of his church, and the church is made up of individual believers, he is indeed working in the lives of believers, including you and me. But we ask, how can suffering and sadness be for our good? 
The answer is that God can use tribulation to give his children chastening or corrective discipline when they need it. God's intent is to drive them back to the word and to the sacraments through which they will be led to confess, confess their wayward behavior, be comforted with the gospel and the assurance of forgiveness, and be strengthened to straighten out and do what is God-pleasing. We see one example of this in the life of David. He committed grievous sins and was brought to repentance and to spiritual restoration through the word of God spoken by the prophet Nathan. Still, David had to endure chastening from the Lord, and this corrective discipline benefited David so that he grew spiritually. We see that in Psalm 51. David became the golden standard by which later kings in Israel would be measured. Here's another example. Some of the Corinthian Christians were going to the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. In his love, God disciplined them so that they would repent and not be lost spiritually and condemned to hell. So, it can always be said that trials in a believer's life will work for the refining of his faith, again, through the means of grace. All believers on earth are constantly in need of refining. Back to the life of Job. The book of Job emphasizes at the beginning that he was right, a righteous, godly man. But as the book unfolds, we see some rough edges to his faith. He protests a bit too much about his being innocent of any wrongdoing and gives evidence of being tainted somewhat by a theology of glory, which is the belief that a godly life means earthly prosperity. By the end of the book, however, after God has spoken to him, Job has been properly humbled. He is a wiser man, and he is stronger in the faith. A key message of the book of Job, though, is that we might, we might not know, at least at first, the full reason or all the reasons why we or other believers suffer. Job was unaware of the dialogue between God and Satan at the start of the book, of the contest between the two, and of how God's purpose prevailed with Job standing forth as a trophy of God's grace. Job's life continues to present powerful theology to believers today. It's possible that Job learned the full story of his situation at a later point in his life. Many times, however, a child of God will not have the complete answer to the question why until he or she enters heaven. So when you ask why, you can tell yourself somehow this suffering has its place in God's good master plan for the world's history and his wide governing, wise governing of all things. So I need to keep on trusting in the Lord. But if in response to that, the further question may arise in your heart, why should I trust the Lord? Then may you always firmly have the answer because of the cross of Jesus Christ. That is God's clearest revelation of his nature and the undeniable everlasting proof of his tremendous love for you and for me. You can remind yourself that because of the cross and the empty tomb, you can be absolutely certain of your salvation, that God is for you, and that you can trust his rule. The almighty wise God in this world is total and good. It is good and wise in itself. It is good and wise for the church. And it is good and wise for each of us individually as children of God. Now may the peace that passes all human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us pray the prayer Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Thank you for joining us in worship today. 
If you would like more information about a church in your area, or if this program has been a blessing to you, please send comments and contributions to MSL Northland, CO Mount Olive Lutheran Church, 2012 East Superior Street, Duluth, Minnesota, 55812. We appreciate your support and prayers for this ministry. My Savior Lives Northland is a production of Stokes Media House in conjunction with the Wisconsin and Minnesota North Districts of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and supported by viewers like you.